Alrighty, guys, welcome back to the Body Meets Mind podcast. Philosophies and strategies for an elevated life. As always, I'm with my co-host, Paulie. Mace, how are you? I'm very, very well, sir. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. For all the listeners, um, Paulie just did a salute. So we're going to keep everyone inclusive and involved here. <laughs> yes, we'll... we'll uh... Fill in all the gaps, that's Fill for sure. Gaps, totally. Hey, guys, we um, we have the privilege of being with Dr. Richard Chambers, and uh, we are looking forward to chatting with him. Richard, firstly, mate, how are you? How is the weather there in Ubud? I'm sure it's terrible. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's shocking, mate. What can I say? You know, the rice field in front of me is just, yeah, not, not doing it for me at all. Yeah, yeah. This, this, is day two, this is day two of what's probably a permanent move to Bali, and I can't wow. tell you how, how good it is, man. I oh. went to ecstatic, went to an like, contact improv dance last night. It was next mm. level. Been just checking out the scene here, and yeah. it's pretty you, good. You must be sitting there thinking, I've really regretted the move from the Melbourne <laughs> weather, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to love about Melbourne, but I was ready for change after the yeah, after the last couple of years, so it's been, yeah. it's been good. Yeah, yeah I understood. I, I mean, Bali has so much to offer. Um, you know, I've got I've got a couple of friends that um, have have moved there and they've done the online thing, and there's no regretting whatsoever. You know, especially Ubud. Ubud is just wonderfully green, and I think the vibe, the people that kind of attract are attracted to Ubud is um, they're beautiful people as well. And there's just such a wellness focus here. All the restaurants are swinging really healthy food. There's ecstatic dance every night of the week. There's mm. yoga. There's just everything on all the time, and so that's how people are vibing here. So. I'm really looking forward to like my friends tell me after about sort of two weeks here, things are going to feel totally different. So, um, I mean, I already feel pretty good, but yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> it, sure. it, bring, it brings something up for me, for me. Uh, and that's, you know, you, you really are a part of the fabric and your environment, right? So once you step into something that just expects to be wellness oriented, that takes on a part of who you are, I feel, to a certain extent as well. Hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. It's just nice to be surrounded by people that are sort of into the same thing, you know, deep practice and movement practice and wellness, and and of course, there's the entrepreneur set here as well. Yeah. Changu is the place where all the digital nomads and the real serious entrepreneurs are moving, but that's like really busy and yeah. and congested. So a bit not not sure exactly where I'll end up, but day two and it's right. working pretty well. How's that dog, by the way? Is a fantastic. <laughs> you, he, you, he's our he's our next guest. That's right. <laughs> you, do you want me to move inside? <laughs> no, all good. They're fine. But yeah, uh, it's totally cool, man. Cool. Right. Um, well, so Rich, why don't you tell us a little bit about um who you are and what you do and um kind of your pathway to now focusing on some of the businesses that you're that you're that you're working on. Fantastic. Yeah. So I'm a mindful leadership consultant. I've got a, a mindful leadership business, drrichardchambers.com. And more recently, I've got a psychedelic leadership retreat startup, uh, eudelics.com, which is E-U-D-E-L-I-C-S. Mm. The E-U prefix, of course, like euthymic is like wellness and the delics part of psychedelics means manifesting. So Beautiful. it's a wellness manifesting business. Mm. I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, I've been practicing mindfulness for like 22 years now, since 1999, and that became... I discovered that as I was finishing my undergrad psych degree mm. um, and I was really unfocused and depressed, to be honest, back then. And I was just really uh, like disengaged and, and depressed when I was doing my undergrad. And I discovered meditation going into my final year. In fact, mm. I discovered lifestyle, you know, medicine basically and wellness. So I started to like go into my final year. I just got sick of feeling like shit basically and started mm. exercising and eating well and getting eight hours sleep and drinking water and all the things that we now know are really good. Um, and I started meditating and that just made the biggest difference. Like I could focus, I started feeling better. I was less caught up in negative thinking. And so <laughs> that became a big part of my, of, of my life. And of course my professional life. And I've been teaching mindfulness and, and doing mindfulness based therapies for the last 20 plus years. And the last mm. 10 years I've been focusing specifically on business leaders, entrepreneurs and change makers. Cause I think that helping them get focused and connected and, and more present is going to have a, a really positive impact on the world. Mm. And then of course the psychedelic renaissance happened and, and that brought in another sort of personal interest of mine. And so now I've got this other startup, Udelix, where we're um, taking business leaders, entrepreneurs, and ultimately politicians is our end game mm, wow. through an eight week program with a five day retreat in the Netherlands or places in the world where psilocybin or other psychedelics are legal. And just mm. that's, that's fantastic. Unbelievable. So That's so cool. good, isn't it? How many how many questions have you got, Paulie? I've got about forty nine. <laughs> Honestly, did we say forty five minutes? Yes. That's about 
45 I'm days. Come, I'm happy to come back anytime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, That's wonderful. Well, so, I mean, I mean, where do we start? Well, um, I mean, the first thing that I was interested in is um, uh, where your research was focused on when you were still studying. Yeah. So I, when I came back to do my honours, basically, like, I'll, I'll give you the, the short version of this. So I finished my undergrad. Um, totally stuffed up the first couple of years because I was basically like I was raving and and using psychedelics recreationally and sure. just not going to class. <clears throat> going into third year, turned everything around, turned around my health, started focusing, learned how to focus, actually trained mm. my brain, mm. started treating uh, uni like a full time job. I'd go to class from nine to five, even if I didn't have any classes that mm. day, and just did really well. And I got the grades to get into honours, but I, I was just completely unmotivated to do that. I mean, like the stuff we learned in undergrad psych was, I mean, it might have helped if I paid more attention. You know, you engage with things, they're more interesting. But at the time, I thought, whatever. Yeah. So I went travelling and deepened my meditation practice, went through and travelling for three years through Southeast Asia and lived mm. in Japan and just went really deeply into my meditation practice. And I was in the north of India, like up in Dharamsala, where the Dalai Lama lives. And I was walking between these two little towns, Dharamkot and Bagsu. And I walked into this little bookshop slash chai shop. And I reckon they had <laughs> 10 books in there. And I pulled a, the first book I pulled off the shelf was a dialogue between the Dalai Lama and neuroscientists. And it was one oh, of the wow. early, one of the first books on that, that like bridging that divide. Mm. And I started reading, I'm like, holy shit, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. So when I eventually came back to do my honors, I started, you know, shopping around trying to find a supervisor who'd let me study. We weren't even calling it mindfulness back then. That wasn't even a term. And so this is like 2002 now. And um, no one was like, no, no one knew what I was talking about. They'd be like, what are you like? Meditation, <laughs> but I eventually found this supervisor who just by chance happened to have an interest in meditation. And so my first research project was on Vipassana, which is the, mm. like the, the, the Goenka Vipassana, which is the practice I was doing at the time. That was my first sort of deep practice. I've now had a couple of other sort of iterations since then. But yeah, so I looked at people going and doing a 10 day Vipassana retreat and uh, looked at, uh, we developed a cognitive task that looked at their, their working memory and attention switching and and and, um, and concentration and processing speed mm -hmm. um so i did that and then in my when i went and did my doctoral studies i looked at uh, uh depression in young people yeah. at a youth mental health service called origin and we, we took them through an eight-week mindfulness course mindfulness based cognitive therapy to look at whether that would um reduce their levels of depression which uh i you could have almost predicted this but what i found empirically is that young people with depression don't do much meditation mm -hmm. and they don't turn up for their assessment session. So it took me like five years to collect all my data and wow. like the, <laughs> the, resu the results were non-significant, except that baseline, the more, the more mindful they were at the start of treatment, the better that the faster they recovered. And it didn't matter whether they were in the mindfulness condition, the treatment as usual condition, which was just like some therapy or even med or even medication, or if they dropped out, you know, at, at, mm. at the start of treatment, if they were more had higher levels of what's called trait mindfulness, like you know everyday mindfulness, better recovery. So, so that's that's been my my research focus. And since then, I've published like if you if you jump on my website, drrichardchambers.com, I've got I think forty publications now. Mm, so wow. in a whole lot of mindfulness related fields, quite varied because I've done all these collaborations with people over the years. And now I'm starting to publish in the psychedelics field as well. And I'm really interested in the synergy between mindfulness and psychedelics published a paper at the start of last year on the sort of the potential a conceptual review on the potential synergies mm. how mindfulness might be a really good thing for people who want to use psychedelics and how people who have a psychedelic experience will probably and in fact this is what we're discovering now they have a deeper meditation practice and their motivation mm. to practice changes as well mm. they become more interested in what you might call sort of awakening or enlightenment rather than just reducing stress or being able to focus that's about yeah, very, very cool. I mean, I've, I've got a lot, but I need to start with um, Dharamsala because that's my uh, a bit of a spiritual home ground for me. I've spent <laughs> yeah. a fair amount of time there, like uh, upwards of six months, and uh, I I spent my fair amount of time around Dharamkot and uh, Baksu and oh, Pat, you know, yeah, yeah. Cloud Gange and uh, the whole bit, and just you know, walking throughout those those parts, it's just. Uh, 
you know, I say, you, you know, when you walk down the street in Melbourne, you can see, I don't know, people used to have posters up on their wall of like, you know, of bands and, you know, rock stars and this, that and the other. If you walk down uh, McLeod Gange, there's like posters of the Dalai Lama and all these different, oh, so um, you know, Tibetan yeah. uh, high profile monks. And it's just a different reality completely. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable anyway. And a beautiful vibe. I mean, I've traveled a lot of India and it's so different up there because they're so just different. different. It's just a different place, a different people. And I really I really vibe with it. If if there are such things as past lives, I've definitely been a Tibetan yogi in a cave for many <laughs> and many of them. I can't tell you how yeah. easily meditation comes to me and how at home I feel, probably like you're describing, Paulie, like when you get to a place like that, it just feels sort of like home right feels like home being in those mountains i could like you you mentioning that word i already get that smell from dharmasala in those mountains it's, uh, it's <laughs> yeah. a it's a pretty magnificent place so wonderful mm, god i'm, I'm uh mate you gotta go there <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean the, the bus ride up there in itself is an experience <laughs> yeah. wow wow i want to get i want to get on an enfield and ride up to lay Ladakh, which is like the next level that's where the legit refugees have, have set up a sort of a new kind of tibet and it's so uh, it's so high in this kind of almost like mountain wow. desert that i think it's like it'd be like being in old tibet very very cool mm. yeah that's awesome that's awesome so do you so i think there's this something i think is going in that's really interesting at the moment is because psychedelics are kind of just on the cusp of being legal there's a lot of people out there that have um you know professional positions and so forth that uh that really want to talk about it um not necessarily about their own personal experiences though i know a lot of people that want to do that as well but because of the you know schedule one and so forth i think schedule nine i can't remember what it is there's just a little bit of hesitancy with it um how did you find your own journey with 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 speaking about it whilst also maintaining maintaining that professional context of being you know a researcher and a, and a clinical psychologist yeah look i've tried pretty pretty carefully i mean i i these days I'm I'm more, you know, happy to tell just my, my personal story. I think it's more engaging for people rather than, you know, hiding behind the sort of professionalism of a psychologist. But I've, I've I've gone pretty cautiously over the years. Um yeah, I mean, even even meditation was a bit mm. kind of weird yeah. for people mm. when I started doing that and started researching it and talking about it. Yeah. And and but, but there is, I mean, Michael Pollan, God bless that man and his book, How to Change yeah. Your Mind, and, and the subsequent Netflix series, you know, and then Goop, and like there's so um, many like like books, and 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 of course we're realizing now how much trauma there is in society, and how psychedelics and meditation are things that might help with that, and people are kind of coming out of the closet and starting to talk about their own meditation practice or psychedelics use. So there's this kind of zeitgeist now, which is great. There's this there's this awakening of, of sort of awareness sort of around the fact that this might be useful. Mm -hmm. I try, I mean, I, I try to be pretty measured and evidence-based in what I do. Like my my Udelix business is right out there on the on, on the edge, you know, on the on the, on the forefront of, of of the psychedelic renaissance, you know, using it for um <laughs> personal and, and for, uh, professional development for leadership development that's not where most of the field is most of the field is sure. focusing on me mental health and yep. and that's of course super important so so we're quite out there one of our, our company values is boldness so we want to be bold but another mm. one is compassion so we don't want to cause any harm Love whatsoever it. and so yeah and, and a lot of the 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 mindfulness researchers and, and so that's the, the psychedelic researchers and the people i really respect they're quite measured and cautious mm. so i'm always sort of got this these this two parts of myself one i'm really <laughs> enthusiastic and bold and just want to get this out there but at the same time you know we've already seen what happens when people like timothy leary get yes. overexcited yeah mm -hmm. and none of us want a repeat of that totally and it's and, and it's an interesting thing because this psychedelic renaissance you know this this sort of legalizing or decriminalizing and this this increasing openness to uh to substances that that totally expand our minds is happening at the same time that we're seeing a sort of an increase in authoritarianism around mm. the world and so it's a weird juxtaposition it's pretty strange so you know, I think it's really important. I think we really need it as a society, both to heal our trauma and just just help us, you know, like envision different ways of being and different ways of leading. Um, but at the same time, being cautious. So that's kind of been my approach. But you know, I'm I'm, I'm happy like, on a podcast like this. I'm always happy to talk about my own journey with it and 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 and, where, and, and why I think it's important. Definitely.
I wouldn't mind talking about leadership. It sounds like you've been in the leadership space for a little while now. Um, what have you found to be the most fascinating and uh, potent forms to be able to guide leaders in the past? And how have you found psychedelics to be now a really pivotal transitional point to take leaders to that next level? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think the first, the main thing that I've been trying to get leaders to do, and when I talk about leaders, I mean, these are C-suite executives, they're middle managers, they're entrepreneurs, they're thought leaders, they're, you know, politicians, anybody who's who's sort of leading anybody and influencing anybody, that's who I'm interested in working with. And one of the main things that I help them to do is just to like just to reconnect with themselves i mean starting with their body being being able to focus first of all focus on what matters mm. that's that's usually what i talk about how to focus on what matters is is the main thing that i'm doing and that might mean being able to you know focus on work rather than getting just distracted by noise it might mean being able to focus on high value work by you know by, by you know using values perhaps to inform what's really important or just doing an 80-20 on, on, on your workflow and figuring out like what you want to give your precious time and attention to. Mm. But of course, with mindfulness, the attention can be outside, focused on, on, on high value work, but it can also be inside and it can be on the body, it can be on the emotions, it can be tuning into values and the deeper parts of ourselves and using that to inform more ethical decision making and and, 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 and more useful behaviours, right, as, as leaders. And so when leaders are paying attention both to what's happening around them and what's happening within them when they're really present with that, they just naturally start to become more ethical. Mm. You know, there was even a, there was a meta-analysis a few years ago that found that people who go through mindfulness training, even if there's no mention of ethics or morality or pro-sociality, it's called, and it's a psychological construct, so, you know, altruism and compassion and kindness, even if there's no explicit teaching just going through a, 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 a deep enough mindfulness training process will naturally make you more pro-social. Mm. And so it's about bringing that out of leaders. It's about helping them to focus on what matters, about connecting with themselves, with others, and becoming also you know, more aware of nature and their interconnectedness with the planet. And that does wonders, you know, I find mm. that even, even just the mindfulness piece, helping people to apply mindfulness in those ways does amazing things, both personally for them and in their relationships but then of course you know as as, as leaders go through you know programs that, are, that i run with them like they just they just become much more ethical much more aware much happier people and then of course you add in the you know the 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 special source and that just fast forwards things i mean i've run over the last 20 years teaching mindfulness i'd say i run like i don't know five six hundred mindfulness programs maybe more it's hard mm -hmm. to even estimate but since I've run these two pilot programs with Udelics, it's just a qualitatively different thing because it's, yeah. there's an eight-week course that I've put together, four weeks of preparation delivered online, a five-day retreat in the middle with two psilocybin ceremonies in the Netherlands where it's legal, and then another four weeks of integration training, again, done online. And so in, in a way, it's kind of like a, an eight-week mindfulness course, which I've run a bazillion of, at, mm. but... It, but, you know, you see the early challenges, you know, people, you know, trying to get a meditation practice established, you know, learning a bit about themselves, reducing their stress levels, whatever. But then in the middle, just magic happens. And that final four weeks is just qualitatively different. You know, people are mm. totally, totally different, just way more open, connected, present, way more motivated to meditate. Their meditation depth increases. And so it's just a, it, it's a very different process. So it's an amazing tool if it's used, if it's used skillfully, mm. if it's used well. For anyone who's listening for it, uh, who's, who's interested in knowing how to use psychedelics in a skillful way, that if they jump on our Udelics website, maybe you can chuck the, the, yeah, um, we will the URL in the, yeah, in, in the show notes, there's a, uh, um, th there's a free guide that we've created on there. That, that, that will pop up if you're on the site for a few secs about how to, about how to use, how to make sure you, you know, they use psychedelics in a, in a way that's safe and effective. So that might be helpful too. That's, mm. that's really cool. And uh, I, I think we're in such uncharted territories now for so many of us who uh, have, you know, like experienced uh, the, the semiology and, uh, you know, the imagery of uh, psychedelics as being such a, um, uh, a dangerous pursuit for so many years. So to be able to uh, see it in a new light and to be able to embrace it is quite refreshing. 
Yeah, there's been such an ideological war and, and it's really sad in a way. I mean, it was just, if anyone interested in understanding the war on drugs, you want to read a book called Chasing the Scream by Johan Hari. He just outlines how it was just, it was this moral crusade by this one guy, Harry Anslinger, who built his entire government career around criminalising plant medicines, you know, the criminalising plants basically, and particularly the, the plant medicines that were associated with, you know, the the, the black culture and jazz yeah, music racist, and, yeah. and Mexican immigrant and total racist. Mm. Yeah. And so, and, and so, you know, it, it was this, it was this crazy, and, and he, it's an amazing book actually, because he, 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 he interviews like drug, uh, drug users, drug therapists, drug smugglers, cartel members, people trying to like, you know, like stop the cartels. I mean, it's amazing, like the depth that he goes into, and it just shows the harm that comes out of criminalizing something like that. And so it's it's kind of sad, but it's a beautiful thing to see that that's starting to thaw now. You know that there is mm. this kind of this, this shift because it's it, it's so important. I mean, another book, Brian Murarescu's The Immortality Key. I don't know if you guys have heard of that book, yeah. but you know that's this guy spent twelve years looking at how psychedelics are a central part of western thought and western religion mm. you know there, there was this there was this uh, annual sort of festival like a sort of a an ancient burning man every year for two thousand straight years uh called the elysian mysteries you know people in ancient greece would head down it was totally secret on pain of death basically no one was allowed to talk about it we only know about it because one dude spilled the beans and got exiled from ancient Greece, and and and, and they were drinking this 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 concoction called kukion, which is probably pro, no one knows, but it's probably some kind of um, psychedelic mushroom, maybe some LSD, or maybe like a mix of things or what whatever you could get. But you know, people from like your whole like high school trigonometry class was there. Like Pythagoras was there, uh, uh-huh. also Pla- Plato and Aristotle. They went through this process. And I think it was Plato that said, like, there's a quote from him that he's like, this is the most important thing in all of Western civilization. Mm-hmm. And if, if this ever ends, you know, woe betide humanity. And of course it did end because the, the church came and shut it down again, sort of ideologically, not wanting people to have a direct connection with spirit or God or whatever you want to call it. You know, of course it was, it was women as well who were running this, who were running this serum, this, this festival basically. And mm-hmm. so there was also that angle. So you know, it's 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 been an interesting history, um, and it's and it speaks to the power. You know, anything that's taboo. You know, anything mm. that, like my, my partner's a tantra teacher and 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 sex coach, and 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 she can't run ads on Facebook. You know, because it's totally yeah. taboo. But it, it's because it's so powerful. Mm. And psychedelics are the same. You know, anything that gets repressed is usually there's a lot of power, and if that if it's used well, it has a lot of potential for humanity, and that's that's what I hope we're seeing here. Mm. So, so it's being reintegrated back into like you know, general kind of conversation now. How important do you feel that uh, current science uh, is to, 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 to validate these types of processes and to actually make it more digestible to the average Joe Blow? I think it's really important, particularly, I mean, you know, working in the leadership space, it's it's incredibly important. What you want to have is solid science, good testimonials from, you know, from solid people, solid humans, and I think that start, and then that goes kind of left brain and right brain, of course, as well, respectively, right? When you've got personal stories and stats and mm. figures. But I think it, I mean, I think it's really important that we do things in an evidence-based way because it is easy to get carried away with something like this because, again, of you know, the, the power in it. I think it gets people a little bit unbalanced, like Timothy Leary. You know, Aldous Huxley, who wrote Doors of Perception, introduced Timothy Leary to psychedelics through um, mescaline and um and was later on he was like hey dude you need to just he's off the pedal calm your farm <laughs> yeah calm, calm the farm call your jets because he was just getting too carried away and so we see that and again like i said we don't want to see that happening again i think the science is really important mm-hmm. same thing with mindfulness you know in mm. the early days before the neuro before the neuroscience studies it was a little bit people didn't engage with it as much and then as we started to see that hockey stick in the research you know there's like thousands of studies published every year now uh, compared to when I did my honours in 2000, 2000, 2003, I read all the studies. There was 43 mindfulness studies in existence. I read, the, wow. I, I, read the, I read them all from start to finish. And now wow. you, there's no way. But we've seen this hockey stick in the research, particularly after MBCT for depression. That was the thing that really kicked it off. And the neuroscience has caught up. And so when people can kind of see mm. something like that, that really helps as well. 
And so when I talk to business leaders or when we when we run programs with leaders, of course, they want to know what the research is. And, and everything we do at Udelix, for instance, is 100% evidence informed. We're doing our own research. We're evaluating our programs. We're doing general research to look at how we might make best use of, of things like psychedelics. And then, of course, you want to hear people like Tim Ferriss or, you know, like, you know, Steve Jobs even sort of talked about the use of psychedelics in, in, in his own work. And, and yeah. so the more people who are, will, are willing to come out and talk about it, the more open other people are going to be. And so it's, it's nice to see that that happening. Although there's still a, a lot of resistance, as you'd imagine, you know, like we get business leaders who come and do our programs um, who are then very happy to talk about it with their friends over the dinner table, but 0% of them will give us a video testimonial, right? We're talking to politicians mm. at the moment um, in the EU and the UK and, and, and final link in with some people in the US and the same thing. Like they're, 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 there's more than you'd think who are either using psychedelics personally some of them are even sort of potentially you know facilitating other people to to get access to it but of course you know personal brand management we're a million years away it seems like from them being willing to talk about that so so i think as the science just yeah, as the science just continues as more and more people come out of the work and say hey this has really helped me and this is how i, th I think we will see a, a greater level of openness and i'm really hoping yeah. it seems like this war on <laughs> drugs has, has gone from being completely you know, worldwide movement to sort of starting to loosen in, in key parts of the world. Thailand just uh, decriminal, no, they, Thailand just legalized cannabis. Wow. Let everybody, let everybody out of jail and expunge their records. And if a place like Thailand's going to do that, yeah, there's hope. That's wild. Humanity, right? Yeah, it's that's wild. wild. Yeah. That is. I did not know that. Um, yeah, that's that, that's remarkable. And there's that tipping point that will eventually happen, right? Yeah. Um, it is fascinating. Uh, I, I, sorry, Tom, I just wanted to draw on, uh, you know, you, you were talking about science, you were talking about mindfulness, but also this this aspect of religion as well. You you referenced um, the Dalai Lama's book that you picked up at that bookshop in, in Dharamsala. I, I feel like I've read yeah. the same book uh, and, and I feel like it was in the same place. Um, it was <laughs> at called, the same time. <laughs> at same the same time. time. <laughs> Next page. Um, uh, was it called The Universe in a Single Atom? Not sure. <laughs> No, it, that was one of the, the so it, was, it was called Healing Emotions. There's a there's a conference that used to happen every two years called the Mind and Life Conference or Dialogues. And so early on, the Dalai Lama got together with some neuroscientists and they were having a sort of a conversation about like, well, how might Buddhism inform what neuroscientists might sort of look at when they're looking at human flourishing and, and consciousness and, and, and how might neuroscience help Buddhists understand what's going on? Because Buddhism is a pretty scientific religion, or or whatever you want to call it, practice, you know. And and, and when you boil it, when you boil it down, it's like people have been observing their mind really closely for thousands of years and documenting it in lists and categories. And so mm. it it marries up really beautifully with Western science because it's 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 scientific. Totally. And so there was this there was this dialogue, and, and and there were multiple books, and so one of them might have been, I think, the universe in a single atom. It might have been a similar, like a, one of the transcripts of the conferences. Mm, yeah, yeah. Cool. but the, but but yeah, the, the the religious aspect of it you're asking about that it's super important. I mean, you know, I started meditating and very quickly was doing deep retreats, and very quickly was realizing, you know, I went from being totally lost in my thoughts. Like probably a little bit ADD, actually, I'm realizing as I get older, like a bit just distracted and lost and very lost in, ang in, in anxious thinking and negative thinking and getting depressed. And, and so, it, you know, when I started to get, when I started to practice mindfulness, for moments I was free from that, mm. just kind of kind of happy when you're just in the moment, you know, everything's kind of just, you at least feel content, yeah. if not a sort of eudaimonic kind of happiness. Mm. And, and then... Yeah, and then I started to meditate more and more and I started to have more and more moments like that. And then I was like, well, you know, and then of course the whole thing is like, what would happen if those moments joined up and you were just <laughs> completely cool. present, completely content with whatever's going on? And that's what just fascinates me. And then you start hearing about enlightenment and what that might look like and mm. it kind of resonated on, a, on an intuitive level. And so that's always where I've come from. Yeah. You know, I've got, I've got that depth in my practice and that depth, of course, is part of what I teach and what I do and the programs that I develop. And not, I, I guess not everybody has that and not everybody's interested in that. Although that's why I think that I, I think psychedelics are a particularly important ingredient because what we're finding in our research is that when people have experienced psychedelics, their, their whole motivation for practice changes. 
Mm-hmm. The metaphor I like to use is the is, is the is the the penthouse, the elevator, and the stairs. You know, you take psychedelics, you go up to the penthouse, the doors open up, you look out over this vista, and you're like, <laughs> "Holy shit! I had no idea. I've never thought about you know seeing life in this way." And yeah. then the doors close, and you go down the basement. And then after a while, you come back up to ground floor, and of course, you can keep doing that. But the the smart people amongst us might figure out, well, if you're just going to go up and down your whole life, is that really, what's that, what's that achieving? And then you realize, oh, hang on, there's some stairs here. And that's the meditation practice. And mm, so if you take those stairs, but now you, it's, it's for a different, it's for a different purpose. You know, like most people are meditating to reduce their stress levels or improve their focus. And that's super important. The mental health benefits are clearly established in the mm. research. The performance benefits, I mean, you look at, you know, neuroscience studies and all the right parts of the brain are getting workouts when you meditate, right? And that's super important. And if that's where people are engaging with it, that's fantastic. But, you know, having taught mindfulness for 20 plus years, like I see, you know, so many people, if their motivation is to be less stressed and they meditate for a while, they practice mindfulness for a while, then they feel less stress and then they stop. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, oh, shit, I'm feeling anxious and stressed again. Okay, get, better get back on that mm. on that practice. And so you, they go through cycles like that. Whereas if the whole purpose of, purpose of meditating is either to be more pro-social and more useful for other people, you know, let, less of a dickhead and just more useful for others, or if it's to have more of those moments of awakening that then join up and, and lead to something that might look like what we call enlightenment or, or sort of awakening, then... Yeah, great. And that's a totally different motivation and one that's kept my practice alive for, you know, 20 years, like pretty much a daily practice for, you know, for for 20 years. But I mean, both of those kind of uh, work symbiotically, don't they? You know, whether you're doing it for awakening or to be more um, pro-social, they can both coexist in a really lovely way. I feel like if you're if you're able to stand back far enough and see life, it's such a beautiful analogy that that elevator analogy. see life as it is standing far you know as far back so it's it's not all trees it's a beautiful lovely forest i feel like naturally you're going to become more aware of other people and less uh you know um uh, self-centered technically speaking which is obviously going to be inducing anxiety and everything yeah and you do i mean anybody that practices mindfulness consistently does just become more aware of themselves and their impact on others and it automatically starts to change Mm change back you know their behavior yeah do you have a self-reflective practice that you tend to kind of uh utilize and uh you you know play out on a daily basis based based around mindfulness etc what what, what do you mean by self-reflective let's just start with mindfulness do you have a mindfulness practice yeah absolutely i mean i meditate every single day first thing in the morning for that these days it's about 30 minutes Mm -hmm. Uh, there's been that times in my life where i've done three or four hours a day and other times when I've sort of done 10 minutes, but 30 <laughs> minutes feels like a good amount of time. Mm-hmm. And I'll sit and practice. There are three types of meditation. Like if you look like, uh, neurologically, if you put people in brain scanners, there are three categories of meditation. Mm-hmm. There's focused attention or concentration practices, which would be like, you know, focusing on the breath and the mind wanders and you keep bringing it back, bring it back. Then there's open awareness practice or open monitoring where you you're not actually focusing on anything. You're just being present and allowing everything to happen around you without getting lost in it. So you do use the breath and the body as a bit of an anchor, but it's not about keeping the attention on that. It's just about resting it lightly there so that when you start to think about something or get distracted by that dog barking or whatever, you just you just come back. And then there's the loving kindness and compassion class of practices. And they're you know, when people are doing each of them, they're neurologically totally distinct. So we know that they're separate classes of practice. And that's interesting because for years, just intuitively, I've used all three of them. Mm-hmm. So I'll get up in the morning and I'll just sit and I'll notice, okay, what's happening in my mind? If I'm really focused and present, um, I love that open monitoring practice. That's that's the And that's kind of like the it's the maturing of a mindfulness practice. Mm-hmm. Like not everyone talks about that, but if you, if, if you listen to the experts, like um, Altered Traits is a book by Richie Davidson and Daniel Goleman. Daniel Goleman coined the term mm. emotional intelligence. Richie mm. Davidson, super well-known neuroscientist, the first guy to be brain scanning the monks right. and kicked Very off the cool. whole field of cognitive neuro, contemplative neuroscience. Very cool. They talk about how you know the, like a, a mindfulness practice when it matures goes from the focused attention or the concentration to the open awareness. Mm. And the open awareness is really more what mindfulness is about. So I'll do that practice if I can. But if I wake up and my mind's like running all over the place, I'll just focus on my breath mm-hmm. at least for a while and, and train that monkey mind. 
or if I wake up and I'm feeling really anxious about something that's coming up or if I'm feeling really triggered or caught in some self-criticism or something like that, those loving kindness practices, which are making kind wishes for yourself and others and compassion practices, I find really important too. But, but the thing I love the most is the open awareness. And mm. then and, and the, the, I, I, I do these days what's called non-dual practice. So I won't bore you with details except to say that right now, as we're having this conversation, all three of us and, and everybody who's listening to or watching this, there's there's something that's watching, right? Where you can see the screen or you can hear the podcast or whatever it is. And, and, and there, there are the things that we're aware of, but there's something that's aware. And what is it that's looking through our eyes right now? What is it that's feeling through our bodies, that's listening through our, through our ears? And if you start to pay attention to that, you realize that there's something here that's not changing. It's not coming and going. It's not changing at all. It doesn't take any effort to create it or maintain it. It's not judging anything. It's not reacting to anything. It's the most stable and 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 ob- the, obviously the healthiest part of us. And most of us totally miss that because we're too lost in the things that we're aware of, all of the thoughts and the experiences and chasing the next, you know, hedonic high or dopamine rush or whatever. And when you step out of that, you have these moments of realizing, hang on, there's something in me that's just just here mm. and this is like the top shelf of, of meditation practices like the, the, like all of the traditions talk about this is like the highest teachings it's Dzogchen and Mahamudra in Buddhism it's the non-dual teachings of Hinduism like the the Advaita sort of um like teachings so that that fascinates me because like it was mm. only like sort of 10 years ago I started asking this I'm like hang on what what, what is looking through my eyes right now mm. you know it's a question that not no one asks themselves that but it's like mm. oh on this like you know like we're so interested in like what's the right way to live my life or what do I want in life and no one ever asks but who, who am I like what is even asking this question mm. and that that's that's what fascinates me and so meditation for me is an inquiry practice now and just that just just explore that one question and keep coming back to that over and over and over again when the mind of course gets distracted by things that are more flashy and and so that's yeah and, and I mean you can probably get what I'm saying there right like if, like if, 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 you, if you were totally connected with that part of you imagine that if, if your mind if, if anything could happen around you and that was totally fine because you were the awareness that that was happening in mm-hmm. that would make you pretty bloody resilient mm-hmm. and this is what psycho this is what psychedelics show people and it's what deep meditation practice shows people and it's 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 made the biggest difference in my life and of course that's why i'm so passionate about helping other people touch this and probably five percent of the people listening to your podcast are going to understand what bloody hell i'm talking about (laughs) five percent of the people that have ever done my courses get this because most people are too lost in the experiences and the the thinking and stuff but for those who get it they're like wow it's a whole different way of living and and my hope would be that more and more people can start to understand Mm. what i'm talking about here because it's the healthiest part of us and why wouldn't we want to live from and as the healthiest part of us love that i mean i mean you, you mentioned resilience there there's a big um big movement for resilience um at the moment, which is obviously a really good thing, but you know, you know, um, for any empiricist out there, what could be more resilient than being able to set yourself on fire and commit suicide in the name of, um, the protest for the, I think it was, I can't remember the name. I think his name was Dick Quan Duc. Do you guys know the picture that I'm talking about? Yeah. The about? Vietnam, yeah. yeah that, that, that iconic the Vietnam Vietnamese, war protest. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the yep. very definition of resilience, really, isn't it? Yeah, or a Tibetan who was, you know, like tortured by, you know, these Tibetan monks who were literally tortured for months or years by the Chinese regime yeah. and and had and then came out and just had compassion yeah. for their torturers who were like, like, like someone who would do that to another human being must be so tormented and suffering. Mm. I mean, how resilient is that? Yeah, mm. that's it. It's, it's, it's amazing. And so, that, um, and, so you, and so you see these examples, right, mm. of people who really practice these are, these aren't people doing five minutes of meditation every day with an app. These are people that are practicing properly. But 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 that's where it can, that's where it can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, hey, Rich, you um you you um spoke about how <clears throat> after um the the use of psychedelics, people that go onto your programs and retreats and so forth, you know, are qualitatively different. Can you talk to us about yeah. some of the experiences? And obviously, we'll keep it confidential. But some of the patterns that um of people what they're saying and kind of what how they're changing beautiful yeah i I love that question um yeah there are look i mean 
in, in in one way everybody has their own journey and, and sure. they and they and they transform in their own ways but i guess there are patterns that we're observing so people become more connected with like the, the research of rosalind watts for instance found that people become more connected with themselves others and the world and that kind of captures it so we see them become much more present with themselves much kinder and more compassionate and, and more aware um, they become more aware of different parts. We have parts of our personalities. I mean, in, in one sense, we're just one person, but we also have these sort of different parts, which is kind of obvious when you're trying to quit a behavior like smoking or start a behavior like exercise. Of course, mm. there's one part that wants to get really fit and healthy, another one that wants to sit on the couch and watch chip, you know, watch Netflix and eat chips and yes. keep smoking <laughs> the cigarettes or whatever. So we have parts, right? And so there are these parts, and there, there, there are parts that sometimes get called the inner child, which is, you know, these really sensitive kind of, you know, beautiful parts of us that most of us are just ignoring or just usually shitting on to be honest you know because mm. we don't want to feel vulnerable vulnerability i mean you know the work of brene brown and people like that are doing wonders for, to help us embrace this mm. but most people like it just feels threatening and not okay mm. but psychedelics help us to and loving kindness practices they help us to get back in touch with those parts of ourselves and to and and to like bring presence and love to them basically mm -hmm. and then they can then they can express their their gifts to the world which is joy and creativity and playfulness and mm -hmm. so i see people go through that process they become much more joyful spontaneous playful much kinder with themselves and more aware of their sort of their inner world and their parts they become much more connected with the planet as well so we i mean you never know what are the like the, the effect of the psychedelics or, or meditation or anything. And what are the effects of what are called um, non-specific factors, like being in a retreat setting with you know, oh, beautiful point. nature around you. Um, and we are finding that psychedelics are non-specific amplifiers. So they will amplify whatever's going on mm, in that mm. moment. So if you, there are right wing kind of crazy cults that use psychedelics as part of their hazing rituals right. to make people more racist and extreme. Mm. But if you have a retreat, like we run that, we always run them in beautiful settings and people spend a lot of time out in nature, even after that, they realize the value of spending time in, mm. in nature and being connected with the planet, perhaps sensing that interconnectedness, uh, which the city kind of city life kind of dissociates mm. us from. Um, people, of course, deepen their meditation practice because they have that elevator to the penthouse experience. And then they're like, all right, I'm going to keep meditating now. And mm -hmm. so even after, even long after the retreats and programs end, they're still, they're still meditating. They become much more aware of what's important because psychedelics disrupts the the the, the 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 monkey mind or what's called the default mode network. There's a part of our brain, literally parts of our brain, that are constantly making sense of the world, thinking about the future, thinking about the past, evaluating what's happening in the present, but always through the lens of how does this relate to me and my survival. Mm -hmm. And that's why we get stuck in these patterns, and that's why we worry about stuff and get depressed, and that's why we you know have this sense of separation from others so psychedelic suspends that it just turns it off mm. for a period of time and in that in that space we just become much more able to connect with ourselves and others in a deeper way because those normal behavioral patterns and thinking patterns are just not there so people just become much more cognitively flexible much more able to see new ways of being they they often shake off old habits you know particularly if if the integration training the, the integration piece that we do is really important mm -hmm. if you just have a peak experience in a psychedelic retreat six months later what's going to be different chances are not a lot mm, yeah. uh, you've had that penthouse experience and you and you know something's different but are you living that are you embodying that yeah maybe not mm -hmm. but if you integrate it properly definitely and then you know just just being able to see like the bigger picture as well you know in relating to others more in, in a more genuine way realizing the importance of self-care and, and and caring for the body and caring for the planet and so that'd be the main things that, that we've seen so far you, you referenced it, it's uh unbelievable what, what you've uh you've just described and it's good for me, for one, has got me excited. But you, you, you've re you've also uh, referenced um, how to safely administer uh, uh, on your website a, a psychedelic experience yourself. Yeah. Do you want Do you want to just take us through briefly that? Obviously, we're going to uh, provide the the details and the, and the references. But I'd love to hear it from you as well. Yeah, fantastic. So absolutely. So to do to do to use psychedelics safely and effectively, you want to do some preparation. You want to do some integration and you want to make sure that when you're using the psychedelics, you're in the right set and setting, what's called the mm. set and setting. The set is like the mindset. 
Like if you if if you uh, you know work all week and you're just totally stressed out and anxious and you're drinking coffee and drinking alcohol and on that sort of on that on that train and then you go and take psychedelics, that's like that's that's really kind of like you know rolling the dice. Like is that going to be a pleasant positive experience? Mm. Is it going to be quite you know difficult, challenging? So you want to make sure that you're in the right mindset. And so the best way to do that would be to, you know, and the recommendations that I made in that in that guide are to do things like, you know, meditating, even just for five, 10 minutes before taking psychedelics, but ideally for a few weeks beforehand, just to sort of calm and, and, and focus the mind uh, to, you know, to uh, to make sure that you get the dose right as well. It's another really important thing. Mm. That's, 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 that's very subjective. So maybe sort of starting with, you know, either doing it with someone who knows what they're doing Right, coming and doing a program like ours, or finding a you know, like a, a, a facilitator, or even just with a friend who knows. I mean, first of all, I, I, I don't want to condone, obviously, you know, sure. illegal use of psychedelics, but I want to acknowledge that people have been using it yeah. recreationally and have been using it for you know personal development, and that that might as well be done skillfully. Hence mm. making the hence making the guide. So yeah, I would say some meditation beforehand, making sure that you're in the right kind of mindset, mm -hmm. making sure you're in the right setting as well. So, you know, you can do it in your living room. That's totally fine. You can go, I mean, you can go to like a music festival if you want, but I, I don't recommend that. Yeah. It's, especially if you want to use it for personal development, I would recommend, you know, being in nature, ideally, uh, being with, with someone or with... Uh, maybe don't do it alone if you need to this, you know, find someone who can be a sitter who takes either a microdose or nothing at all and just looks after you mm -hmm. um, or doing it in a pro, you know, in a, in a retreat or a program like that. Um, like I said, you want to get the dose right. You want to resist the temptation to take a top up. If it doesn't feel like it's working, I think a better option would be like, if you don't take enough, just enjoy having a microdose and get to know it on that microdose level. And then at another, you know, a week later or whatever, you know, take a bigger dose and see mm, see what okay. that see what that does for you. Um, yeah, there's you, you want to expect turbulence as the psychedelics start to come on. Often the body feels really uncomfortable, and sometimes people panic about, "Oh shoot, am I dying here? What's going on?" And just just to know that that's part of the journey. It's like a plane heading up into the clouds. You know, you start hitting the clouds, and things start to shake, and all sorts of stuff comes up. And, you know, you want to just ride that out and eventually you're probably going to pop out above the clouds and things are going to be kind of like smooth or you're going to stay in the clouds and it's going to be a bumpy ass ride. Mm. And what's important to know then is that if you just allow whatever's happening to, to happen and surrender to the experience, uh, that's even if it's quite challenging, even, even if like a lot of unresolved emotions are coming up or traumas are coming up or, or things are kind of challenging, if you can just surrender to it and ride through the experience, you'll come out the other side with, you know, with, with something positive out of that. It's when you resist, and this is, I guess, the main thing. If you resist the process of psychedelics, you're going to have a pretty intense time because you can't stop it. Mm, yeah. And if, you, if you're getting anxious about what's happening, then you're going to have serious anxiety during the process, you know. And so, and so that's probably the main thing to trust the, almost like the benevolence like some some you know particularly in, in the shamanic traditions not so much in the psychedelic science traditions but in the shamanic traditions people talk about this kind of almost like benevolence it's mm. almost like the psychedelics kind of want you to have a healing experience and if you surrender to that no matter what's happening then that's likely to produce something really positive for you and that's why the meditation i find really mm. important and i think mindfulness and psychedelics go together so well because my meditation is a training in just being with things the way they are, no matter what's going on. Love and it. so if you practice that, and so then you've, you've, you've had the psychedelic experience. And then of course, you know, out the other side, if you want to, if you want those insights to uh, lead to lasting changes, you want to be doing some kind of integration practice. And that might be journaling, might be meditating every day. It might be getting out in nature It might be spending time with people who, you can be really vulnerable and real with. I mean, there's a whole lot of things and I've included them in the guide as well, like things that you can do to integrate that that practice. And I think when you do that full picture, that's when you're going to do things safely and effectively um, and, and, right. and hopefully get something really positive from it. Cool. Wonderful. Well, Rich, we're, um, <clears throat> we're, we're certainly aware that uh, uh, we've got to get you out here at some point, but, mate, I just I, I wanted you to um, um, respond to one final question. I was thinking... 
with everything that you're doing, I can start to get a bit of a feel of how you might like to see an ideal world. But rather than put my own assumptions on that, I'd love for you to, to, to talk to us about how you see your work um, culminating in an ideal vision for um, from where it's going and, and, and the world in general. Huh, what a nice question. Um... Look, I would have to say to that that I would love people just to be more present with themselves, more deeply connected with those healthy parts of themselves, that that awareness I was talking about, mm. the, the, the intrinsic values um, that we all have but are so often so cut off from. I'd love to see people be a bit less distracted and more able to focus on what matters um, personally, I, I think I'd like to see people more like more connected with nature and the natural world and realizing their interconnectedness. Um, but you know, I think if people just become generally more aware and present with themselves and others, I think then life's just going to move in the direction that it needs to move in. I don't actually know, like I would never want to make a checklist of how of, of what is the right way to live. I mean, sure. science points towards things like, you know, being present and, you know, live like pro social pro sociality, you know, altruism and generosity and, and compassion, loving kindness. These are all things that, that science shows like definitely lead to better mental health mm. and better societal functioning, better relationships. You know, I think people being you know aware of their values and what's important, it, all this stuff's, all this stuff's really important. Mm. But like it, it'd, be, it'd be hard to paint a picture of what an ideal society would actually look For like sure. uh, just because I don't think we can know. It's something that we have to just sort of discover moment by moment. And and, we, and the only way to discover that is to stop being so goddamn distracted and reactive <laughs> all the time and to actually be a little bit more present. And so any practice, whether it's meditation, whether it's psychedelics, whether it's just, you know, getting away from the phone, you know, sport, exercise without the headphones in, you know, anything that just mm. gets us more present and, and listening to ourselves and others, I think is naturally going to guide us in the directions that we need to go in. Mm. Perfect response. Love it. Love it. Well, um, where can people find you? Obviously, we're going to put the the show notes um, for the podcast, but uh, why don't you give us a bit of a plug and um, and you can also mention what's on the horizon for you as well. Fantastic. Yeah. So there are two places to find me, drrichardchambers.com. So that's drrichardchambers.com is my mindful leadership website. And you will you can like read my books and articles and find out more about me. You can get in touch with me. You can find out about my online programs. Um, and then Udelix, which is E-U-D-E-L-I-C-S.com. Uh, that's the psychedelic retreat business. Um, and so they're two really good plan, and, and that's where that guide is that I was talking mm. about. So they're two. I've got some meditations on my Dr. Richard Chambers website. There's that guide on the um, on the Udelix website. So they might be really useful for some of your listeners. On the horizon, yeah, just launching some online programs. I really want to scale the work that I'm doing. I really want to get into more and more and more businesses and work with leadership teams. I'm loving doing that work, just really nice. transforming. I've got a 12-week process, which is either a an, an online program or actually in the business delivering it live. And mm. when I do that, man, it just it really changes the game. So I'm loving that. And Udelix just obviously wanting to scale that and to work with more and more leaders around the world and ultimately, like I said, politicians. Any politicians out there, come to our program because we need you to be more switched on. And uh, Sorry, Donald. More connected yes. and present. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a guy I should. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Get... Why would I have his number? <laughs> yeah, we want Donald, yeah, we want Donald and Vlad and, and yes. we've decided for each for each of them we're going to have 20 facilitators holding. Yes, that's right. That's <laughs> you, right. You can only imagine the shadow material that would start coming oh, up, the, the trauma that would come up. Oh, my time. God. It would be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, well, Richard, thank you so much, mate. That was fantastic. We'd love to have you on again. Absolutely. Yeah, Tom, Paul. Yeah, yeah I hope this goes really well for you. This this new co-branded podcast that you're doing It's fantastic. Yeah, thanks, thanks Rich. Yeah. Oh, it's very exciting. It's very, very yeah, exciting. Yeah, amazing. Thanks for the chat. Yeah. I love having these chats. It's been awesome talking to you. And yeah, hope to see you again sometime. You're a Beautiful. legend. Thanks, mate. Cool. cool. Thanks, guys. Speak to you next week. Bye.